We're going to take a look at ground contact times and how they can inform and shape the way that we train so that we can get the most from our jumping and sprinting. Ground contact time somewhat obviously refers to the time that our foot is in contact with the ground when sprinting and jumping. We're looking at milliseconds. We also have to mention rate of force development, RFD. That refers to the force, the power that is developed on ground contact and through ground contact. As we shall see later in the video, being able to create maximal muscular tensions in very short ground contact times is what's crucial to improving long jump and triple jump, for example. Hold that thought about optimum rates of force development in optimum time frames, i.e. ground contact time, because that's what's going to shape our plyometric training so that we can make it as transferable into our specific events as possible. For me, and according to a lot of research, what's crucial when it comes to doing drop jumps and hurdle jumps is the speed of reaction to the contact. Instruct your athletes, if you're a coach, to get off the ground as quickly as possible as opposed to going for as much height as possible. Why is that so? Because we are interested in being able to generate the maximum amount of force, rate of force development in the optimum quickest ground contact time as that is going to transfer more into the specifics of the long jump takeoff and sprinting for example. On screen now you're just seeing some Japanese research which indicates what I've just said is the case when it comes to hurdle jumping, i.e. going over higher hurdle heights can be disruptive in terms of joint angles and doesn't make a huge difference when it comes to generating vertical height from the ground. Most coaches, and obviously that includes myself, together with much research indicates that you want your ground contact times from your plyometric activities to be very close to those involved in your chosen event, long jump, triple jump, sprints, etc. Bearing in mind as well that as a long jumper or a triple jumper, you've got sprint contacts as well as ground contact times on the board or through the phases in the triple jump. So therefore we need to have a amalgamation of specific plyometric activities which is going to transfer into those crucial aspects of the event. This is why I utilize lots of fast movement plyometric drills, lowish height drop jumps, lowish height hurdle jumps. I'm not a great believer in the utilization of normal hurdle hopping double footed jumps over hurdles in succession. I've started to utilize drop jump hurdle jumps in succession, whereby as you're seeing on screen now, the athletes go from a low platform, land on the track, jump over the hurdle, onto a low platform, jump over the next hurdle. This I believe can speed up the contact times and reduce what I call dwell time, time on the ground between contacts. In terms of ground contacts for drop jumps, you're looking at for 20 centimeters to 60 centimeter drop jumps, contact times between 1300 milliseconds and 300 milliseconds. And for a 40 centimeter drop jump, you're looking at a ground contact time of 200 milliseconds. It's all about being specific, utilizing the best plyometric exercises that you can that relate to the ground contact times and to some extent the movement patterns of your event as well. In one of my coach athlete members videos I looked at some German research which related 100 meter time to jump distance, long jump distance, but part of the research was what are the best conditioning activities to develop jump ability and this is what the Germans had to say. The most important factor for consideration is not rapidity of movement but the speed of development of maximal tension within a period of time. Now that may seem to contradict what I said about making sure that you react as quickly as possible. However, if you try to react as quickly as possible, over time you will be able to generate maximal amounts of muscular tension in that minuscule time frame as your leg stiffness and neural contributors to reactivity improve. The whole structure of your hip, knee and ankle will develop a greater capacity to return maximal force within those milliseconds of ground contact time. Interestingly, the Germans utilized 
what I believe is a drop jump, they call them low jumps with a vertical displacement, whereby the ground contact times are very quick and the rate of production of force and muscular tension is equally quick within that very small time frame. Hence, I've always believed in the use of drop jumping as a key fundamental inclusion for long and triple jumpers. It's important to consider also the way the foot strikes the ground when doing your plyometric activities in relation to ground contact time. Now, when you take off in the long jump, your foot comes down onto the board heel first and then the toes land. In the triple jump, it's even more potentially flat-footed, although with a heel lead as the foot goes out of the hop contact into the step and then from the step to the jump. Whereas in sprinting, you're going to be higher up on your forefoot in maximum velocity. It therefore makes sense, at least to me, to utilise different types of plyometric activities which have different foot placements. Therefore, we can replicate what's going to happen in the actual event itself. So, we'll be doing, for the triple jumpers for example, more vertical displacement bounding with a more flat-footed contact. Yes, with activation coming into the contact, the pouring motion, but trying to lift the centre of mass from that flatter, more stable base. That's what's going to happen when you exit the hop phase and the step phase and the triple jump. So therefore, it makes sense to teach your body to be able to fire its muscles and ligaments and tendons in a way that it's going to have to do when you're competing in the event itself. Briefly, I found out what Chinese long and triple jumpers do. Now they're some of the best jumpers in the world and I was informed about their practices and the way they do plyometric training for example by Ralph Oman who's got a page on Instagram called Tailwind Squad so do check that out. Basically he was explaining how ground contact times are crucial to the Chinese athletes training for example and how those are managed to bring about peak jumping ability as the season competitive season nears. So these jumpers are not going over three foot six high hurdles for example when doing double footed bounding jumps or at least not that regularly. What they do is utilize ground contact time to inform the height of the hurdles over which the jumpers should jump. So they're optimizing that reactive force in the type of ground contact that is relevant to the long and triple jump and also trying to create those maximal muscular tensions rate of force development in those milliseconds so it's not all about trying to jump over the highest hurdles possible it's about trying to work out the ground contact times and as I've already pointed out in this video, looking also at the joint angles that are used when jumping over hurdles in this instance and making those more relevant to the event itself. So hopefully that gives you further contextual information and credence to the views that it's not all about jumping over as high hurdles as you can, but rather about rate of force development and specific ground contact times. Now, there's a lot more to this subject of ground contact times than I'm able to get across in a short video. Each jumper possesses a different way of getting power out of their limbs. Some will be more eccentric, some will be more elastic, some will be more concentric, some will be more speed velocity based. Therefore, again, we've got to shape our ground contact time training, our plyometric training to specifically benefit those types of jumpers. I'll give one example. If you've got a very concentrically biased jumper who dwells on the time and tries to lever themselves off of the ground, then you've got to be able to improve their eccentric capacity so that they can absorb and then return jumping ability, force power as fast as possible. Otherwise, you're only tackling one part of the equation, one part of the stretch reflex. So we need to be very mindful of the specifics of our jumpers and tailor make their plyometric program to them. In the UK now, we've come to the end of the indoor season and we're now entering a transitional phase between the indoor season and the outdoor season, which I've got three training blocks. I'll be updating you on the content of what we're doing in those particular blocks over forthcoming videos, and I'll be returning to this theme of plyometrics and different types of plyometric drills and exercises. If you have any specific questions on what I've said in this particular video, or indeed any of my others, then do leave a comment or a question in the section below or through my other social media. 
and good luck with your training make it as specific as you can and then you're going to get the results and if you do have any competitions coming up good luck with those of course video shoes do make a difference when it comes to ground contact time and the way that muscles are activated and pre-activated my group and myself are going to be putting to test very soon these Antipes muscle runner shoes which are a spike that isn't a spike basically they have a carbon fiber plate and are designed to throw the momentum of the athlete when sprinting and doing plyometrics for example forwards rather like a sprint spike so do look out for our review of these particular shoes